Well, hello there. Good morning and welcome to First Free Church here in South Minneapolis. For those of you watching online today, good morning to you or afternoon, whenever you might be watching. We are glad that you are here and part of our worship service this morning. I have a couple of quick announcements. Um, first, my name is Carrie Boyam. I am the Children's Ministry Director here at First Free. And on behalf of the staff and the leadership here, we are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today in person or online. Christmas Eve is coming. Thursday, can you believe we have made it almost to Christmas Eve? Uh, we are going to be having a live stream service at 4.30 p.m. that day. We have two in-person services, 4.30 and 6 o'clock. We ask that you make a reservation prior to that day. Our 4.30 service is full, but there is still space at the 6 o'clock service. So if you are wanting to come in person, get online to the first free website and register to attend then. The following two Sundays, January 3rd and December 27th, we are only going to be worshiping together online. We are not going to have any in-person services December 27th and January 3rd. Those are going to be online at 10 a.m. Would you stand and join us in worship today? Well, one thing I want to acknowledge is that uh, we, this is typically the Sunday that we have had the orchestra lead us in song. And I want to acknowledge that that's a loss <laughs> this year to not be able to do that. And I just want to say thank you to those that have participated in the orchestra over the last few years. I'm missing not hearing you guys practice after services and all the time you've invested um, in the past years. And I want to say to those that are worshiping at home or here that have been part of the orchestra next year, I believe by next year we'll be doing this, the Christmas orchestra again on this Sunday. So you got plenty of time to practice, all right? We'll just look at it as a pro, okay? All right. Well, let's, uh, let's sing some of these good news Christmas carols together this morning, all right? Angels, we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains. Why your joyous strings prolong 
I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus, for all of my days. The highest of praises be unto your name. My God, my Savior, my King and my friend. Yours is the glory. have a seat. Well, this is our third week of Advent. The last couple of weeks we've had our scripture reading done by families who have not been necessarily with us here in our church building. We've been so appreciative of that. Today's Advent reading is going to be done by a number of kids from our church. Many we have not seen um, for quite a while, so it'll be fun to see them on the screen Following the Advent scripture, we have a great video of our Advent and Christmas art gallery. We had submissions from a number of people within our church, ranging in all ages, so it'll be a treat to see their art expressed in the video. Luke 2, 1 through 20. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken out of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave 
birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flock that night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appear with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. All who heard were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had been told. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It's the night of the dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in Sin and error pining Till he appeared And the soul felt its worth A thrill of hope The weary world rejoices For yonder breaks A new and glorious morn Fall on your knees Oh hear the angel voice says Oh night divine the night and Christ was born Oh night Pray with me. Lord God, we have come this morning to worship you, to be reminded what you have done for us, your journey from heaven to earth, your journey from perfection to a barn, a stable, a manger. Lord, we worship you this morning as our king. You are the king of kings, and yet you have lowered yourself to become flesh, to walk among us, your creation. We're awed by your love and overwhelmed by the joy of your presence. Lord, as we are fully aware, we are surrounded by darkness. 
And at times, that darkness, it seems overwhelming in our lives. We know that we are weak and we know that we need your light. We are lost and we need your guidance. We are hopeless and we need your hope. And you have given all of those things to us in your son who was born on that Christmas morning, Jesus Christ, the one who is the life and who is the light. Father, we also have come this morning in need of your touch. Holidays can be joyful, but they can also be full of stress, especially this season, this holiday of 2020, with the pandemic surrounding us and concern and worry. And there are some that are here this morning, others that are watching online today that just need to hear your voice. We pray that you might lift up those who are distressed and comfort those who are hurting and heal those who are sick. Now, Lord, we ask that you would speak to us through your word, that today might not just be... Um, a, a day of going through a ritual. But might your voice be the only one we hear, and we ask that you would move in our lives powerfully. Might we be obedient to your voice. We pray these things in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Christmas, of course, uh, as we all realize i think if we think about it uh, too long is it's a time of surprises it's a it's a season of surprises a lady was uh preparing her christmas cookies and a knock um came at the door she went to the door and she found a uh, a man that was standing there is dressed uh, clothes poorly obviously looking for some Christmas handouts, maybe Christmas odd jobs. He asked her if there's anything that he could do, and she said, well, can you paint? He said, yes, yes. In fact, I'm, I'm a rather good painter. She said, well, there are two gallons of green paint there, and there's a brush, and um, there's a porch out back that needs to be painted. Please do a good job, and I'll pay you for what the job is worth. He said, fine, sounds good, I'll, I'll be done quickly. <laughs> she went back to her cookie baking and didn't think much about it until a short time later, there was a knock on the door. She went and the obvious, um, uh, obviousness of his painting was, was evident because <laughs> the paint was all over his clothes, all over his hands. And she said to him, she said, well, did you finish the job? He said, yes, yeah. He, she said, well, did you do a good job? <laughs> and he said, yes, yes, I think I did. But he said, lady, there's one thing I'd like to point out to you. That's not a, a, a Porsche back there. That's a Mercedes. <laughs> Christmas is full of surprises, isn't it? Um, it, it? It's full of surprises. In fact, it, things that can take your breath away. <laughs> Uh, and I think that's an okay. I think that's an okay thing to have our breath taken away because life at its best is not really measured by the breaths necessarily you take, but rather by the breaths that you miss. Um, it's those times of amazement and, you know, astonishment when suddenly your attention is carried away and your breath along with it. I wonder if that was not the type of experience what Luke is referring to when he states in Luke chapter 2, but Mary treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. You know, I, I have to believe that uh, Mary was caught up, don't you, in the wonder of this miraculous birth of her son and her breath, <gasps> don't you think, had to be just taken away? I want to invite you to turn with me to what the Luke chapter 2, the, the, the story that the children just read to us online there. Luke chapter 2. Um, 
Again, verse 19, here's where we find it. Luke 2, verse 19, but Mary treasured up all of these things, pondering them in her heart. <laughs> Sometimes I, I tell you, I... I have to ask, and maybe you have too. He said, you know, I wonder what Mary was pondering, right? I wonder what Mary was treasuring in her heart so deeply. I, I wonder if, if all that she was thinking about, I wonder if it just didn't take her breath away. Don't you? You know, I wonder if, if Mary wasn't pondering the miracle of God's son being born in a feeding trough. After all, Mary had been told by the angel Gabriel that her son would be great and that um, he would be called the son of the Most High and he would sit on the throne of David and he would reign over the house of Jacob forever. <laughs> that was what she was told, then you have to wonder why he was born in a barn. <laughs> why a feeding trough? After all, God is God, right? <laughs> and every part of this nativity uh, story, it has, um, it's been carefully orchestrated by him. I mean, you can see God's fingerprints all over. Look with me at Chapter 2, verse 1, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world shall be registered. Look with me down at verse 6. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. See, the events surrounding the birth of Jesus were progressing, not just according to the plan of Caesar, but more importantly, more significantly, according to the plan of God, God's divine plan. The Apostle Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 4, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. See, God's in control. He's the one that moves the hands of the, of the clock. And if that's true, then nothing in this story was done by accident, right? I mean, it's not like... It's not like God failed to make a hotel reservation, you know, on time. I mean, Jesus could have been born anywhere in the world, right? Why is it so important that there was no room for him in the inn? Why, why is it so important that he would be born in, in a stable, on a dusty floor, in hay, with animals just surrounding him? Listen, you got to understand, remember, we're talking about Jesus, right? I mean, the second person of the Trinity, who's able to free people in prison by their bad decisions. This was Jesus, who's able to give humanity a renewed relationship with their creator, God. I mean, this is, this is Jesus, able to transform individual and... Um, uh, individual lives and whole communities uh, for good. I mean, this was Jesus <laughs> who's able to break the power of, of death and offer the gift of eternal life. This is Jesus, the King of glory, the, the Son of God. Yet when his family gets to Bethlehem, a village is so small that <laughs> people had a hard time finding it on a map, uh, a village not big enough for a hotel. The guest lodging is full. And despite the urgency, no one was willing to uh, make room for them. The only spot available was there where the animals were tethered. And when Jesus is born, his mama puts him in a feeding trough. <laughs> a feeding trough. What? That's a crazy place to put him, isn't it? A crazy place to put the Son of God. A crazy place to put the hope <laughs> of the entire world. Don't you think Mary pondered that? Why? Let's ponder with Mary for a moment. How about we flip it around? Let's ask some what ifs. What if, 
what if Jesus was born in a king's palace? I mean, what would that mean for the world? I mean, he certainly would have had uh, safety and, and privilege and access to power, right? But how would I reach him? Me, I, I, I mean, a, I don't know, a middle-class guy from the city? I mean, would I have had to wait in line? Would I have had to uh, stand outside the palace gates? Uh, what if Jesus was born, I don't know, to an average, uh, nice average family? Nice average family home. I mean, what would that have meant for the world? I mean, it'd feel great, right? At least, uh, I think, for most of us here. Um, it, it would feel great knowing that Jesus was like me. But what would it have meant for uh, the poor, for um, the outcasts? What would it have meant for the, the nobodies of this world? When God commits to come to earth, would a, would a wealthy, uh, upper-crust birth say he's too good to be like one of them? But here among the animals, among the, their sweat and, and dung, born on cold, hard ground, no one could say, that little baby is out of my reach. No one could say, no, no, he's too good for me. No one could say, he doesn't understand my life. <laughs> Isaiah 57 tells us that God dwells with the contrite and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. See, Isaiah teaches us that while humanity, we might spend all of our time trying to climb up the energy, uh, try, tr trying to climb up the ladder, um, God was stepping down the ladder. When God had a chance to offer the gift of hope, for a whole world, he put that hope where anyone in the world could reach him. And I wonder if Mary didn't ponder this all in her heart. That the miracle of God's son being born in a feeding trough so that you and I might reach him. We might be able to reach him. I also wonder as Mary is reflecting on the birth of, uh, of her son, if she didn't ponder the miracle of the glory of God coming to shepherds out there in the fields. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I mean, you and I are familiar with the, the scene, right? Some shepherds happen to be out in the field there at night and tending their flocks, and suddenly they're shocked when the sky is lit up and an angel appears to them. And look at me in verse 9. Look what it says here. And the angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. In that moment, heaven and earth, uh, they, they seemed to mingle. An angel, uh, most likely, probably Gabriel, stood before the shepherds, dazzling eyes, uh, while the glory of the Lord enwrapped them. And they were terrified, scared to death, <laughs> unable to say a word. And there's a connection I want to suggest between the glory of God and the fear of people. You say, well, Sutton, uh, where do you get that from? Well, from this passage, but also two other passages. One of them um, it, from Isaiah's testimony. Remember Isaiah's testimony when God's throne room was opened up before him and the glory of the Lord uh, swept its courts? Isaiah's only response was what? Woe is me, for I am lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And Isaiah's response was the same as these shepherds out there in that field. It was one of fear. It was one of trembling before the glory of God. The second passage is found in Romans 3, 23. You know, you're familiar with that, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What that verse tells me is that sin has entered 
the world, entered into the hearts of Adam and Eve and every person since then, and created a great distance between the glory of God and sinful humans. We've all sinned. And the glory and perfection and beauty and majesty of God in us has been tarnished. And so now there's this gap between us and God's glory. As a gap, the gap between us, uh, between God and between us, when, who we are designed to be and who we know ourselves to be, that gap creates fear in life. I mean, you remember how Adam and Eve responded, right? How they, they reacted immediately after they sinned. What'd they do? <laughs> they hid in fear. They ate that fruit from the tree, and then they realized they had fallen short of the glory of God, that God's perfect design for them, and fear overwhelmed them. See, the fear that you and I experience every day in life is a fear that results from being aware of this gap, the distance between who we were designed to be and who we really are in this tarnished world of ours. And fortunately, for this reason, for our fears, Christ came. He came to conquer our fears. And the shepherds learned this as they stood there um, Shaking in their sandals, the glory of the, of the Lord showing around them, and they were in the presence of God's glory. And the shepherds realized how small and unworthy they really are. And then the angel said to them, what? Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. <laughs> and as soon as the angel announced it, that um, Christ is a savior, a solution had been born. Heaven, boom, exploded. <laughs> and there was even a greater flash of light, and an entire multitude of angels appeared, and they began to sing a Christmas carol. The song is short. You can read about it here, right? It's short, but it's profound. They sang, glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. That little song, it holds a solution to our fears, yours and mine. Um, when Christ came to the world, he brought two things, right? First of all, he brought the glory to God. Jesus' birth was vertically focused. Glory to God. And second, he brought peace. And that blessing is not only vertical, but it's also horizontal. This child who brought glory to God also brings peace for those who have been favored by God's grace. Christ came into the world to glorify the Father. And he was not only born to us, but he died for us. And in the life and death and resurrection, the gap between God and us was closed. Christ came to change our hearts, to remove from us the heart that was tarnished and dulled from sin, to restore and regenerate in us a new heart that um, we might day by day begin to reflect again, once again, the glory of God. Christ came to restore us to God's original design. And when we live according to God's original design, we live in peace. A life of peace, a life free of fear. It's only found in the relationship with Jesus Christ, who changes us from the inside out. And I wonder, I wonder if, if Mary didn't ponder all of this in her heart. The miracle of God's son being born in a feeding trough so that you and I could reach him. And also, the miracle of the glory of God coming to those shepherds out in the fields so that you and I, we, we don't have to fear. You know, I also wonder, <laughs> as Mary was meditating on the birth of her son, if she didn't ponder a third miracle, 
that took place. The miracle of the angels singing about God's son being born. Now, of course, Mary didn't um, hear those angels singing about her son. She had only been told about their song uh, from the shepherds, right, who came and, and visited her. But Mary must have believed in angels, right? I mean, she had to, since she had once, once encountered one herself nine months earlier. <laughs> so no doubt her interest had to be piqued when they told her, when the shepherds told her about the sky being filled with all of these singing angels. You realize that throughout history, God has used angels to communicate special news, right? Angels have, been, have made some pretty important announcements to uh, kings and priests and prophets. They've announced life and death. They've announced victory and defeat. They, they've announced judgment and, and, and mercy. But the most important announcement in the history of humankind was when angels were commissioned to announce the birth of God's son. Once again, let, let's just ponder with Mary. Can you imagine what the strategy session must have been like when the angels got together and they started brainstorming how they were going to make this particular announcement? <laughs> I, I just play around with it in my mind. I, it, it seems like the most important announcement ought to be made to the most important people in the most important place at the most important time, don't you think? So angels, I, I can just see them. They, they come together to make this plan, to make this announcement, and they said, you know, I, I think the place to make this announcement is at the uh, at temple in Jerusalem. And they decide that they're not only going to do it then, but they, they're going to do it uh, at an annual, one of the annual feasts, um, when there'll be thousands of Jewish pilgrims uh, from all over Israel that will be gathered together. Then they decide, you know what, let's make sure that we tell the priests first. They're feeling pretty good about their plan, the angels, and when God, you can just see him, he just walks into the room and he makes a few minor adjustments to their plan. <laughs> Instead of a temple in Jerusalem, he chooses a hillside outside of Bethlehem. Instead of an annual feast, he chooses the night shift. <laughs> Instead of uh, priests, he picks the shepherds. The angels, what they do is they, they take their plans, they crumple them up and throw them <laughs> over in the recycle bin. You and I, see, we take the Christmas story for granted because, you know, we've heard it so many times, right? But God, see, he could have announced the birth of his son any way that he wanted. Why did God do it the way he did it? Max Lucado has an interesting take on this. He says this, had the angel gone to theologians, they were first consulted their commentaries. Had he gone to the elite, they would have looked around to see if anyone was watching. Had he gone to the successful, they would have first looked at their calendars. So he went to the shepherds, men who didn't have a reputation to protect or an axe to grind or a, a ladder to climb. Men who didn't know enough to tell God that angels don't sing to sheep and that messiahs aren't found wrapped in rags and sleeping in a feeding trough. Can you imagine the joy and the wonderment of the angels when at long last um, the infinite becomes definite and the God the Spirit becomes God the flesh? When the Son of God left heaven and, and, and comes to earth? Since they had seen him from the very beginning, you wonder at the amazement that had to be theirs as they watched all this take place there in that little town of Bethlehem, there in, in that stable in a, in a stall with straw, this glorious son of God was born to a human woman. <laughs> and then they get their chance to join in in the excitement and they go out singing glory to God in the highest of heavens. And their song moves these shepherds, moves the shepherds to go look for this one that they were told about. When they find Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus lying there, just as they had been told, the shepherds could not contain themselves, could they? 
They just couldn't hold it back. Immediately, they began to, to, to share the good news of Jesus' birth, and they, they followed the lead of the angels, and they testified to what God has done in the birth of his child. And this good news is just too good to hold in. And that's exactly what took place. Remember, after John the Baptist's miraculous birth, Remember what happened there? After Zechariah's mouth and tongue were loosened, he, he praised God. He broke out into a, a song of praise, and his friends heard him. And they began to talk about all of this throughout Judea, the country, uh, hill country of Judea. And it was hot but holy gossip that spread like wildfire. And these shepherds, they do the same thing. They do the same thing. And I want you to notice the progression. Do you notice the progression in the story? They heard the angels. Then they head to Bethlehem, and they see the child there. And then they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning the child. Makes a point, doesn't it? See, friends, you cannot speak of what you have not seen and experienced in your own life if you haven't experienced it. But when you embrace Christ, see, something happens in you. You know it. The Apostle Paul says the love of God is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Listen, if you, like the shepherds, have experienced that, <laughs> then you have to tell others about it. Because the news is just too good to hold in. It's just too good. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. Now I know, none of us exactly knows what Mary pondered. <laughs> but I have to believe that as she thought deeply about all that took place on that first Christmas, she must have pondered the miracle of God's son being born in a feeding trough so that you and I could reach him. I have to believe that she pondered also the miracle of the glory of God coming to shepherds so that you and I, we don't have to fear. My guess is that she also pondered the miracle of the angels singing about God's son being born to those shepherds. Because the, the news was just too good, too good to hold in. <laughs> Listen, you and I, we live on a visited planet. One where God himself was born. Walked among us, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. And what God has done, friends, it's astonishing. Does it take your breath away? <gasps> Does it? Does it make you want to rejoice? Does it want to make you, you, you worship? Does it make you ponder? Listen, if I could give all of you, each one of you this morning, a gift, the gift I would give you is the pondering heart of Mary who lay they're quietly on that pile of damp straw and held her newborn son close to her breast and pondered the miracle of Jesus' birth. <laughs> what a miracle. From my heart, I wish to each of you a Merry Christmas. Did you catch what I'm saying? <laughs> May God bless you and give you a merry Christmas. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, a miracle. God, might we just pause, stop our busy lives, rejoice and worship and ponder the miracle. The miracle 
of your son's birth. Amen. You stand and sing together.
Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, before I give you the sending, I just want to remind you that we'd love to have you join us again for one of our Christmas Eve services, but you need to register online ahead of time for that. So if you haven't done that, please remember to do that. And then our next two Sundays uh, will be online only. So just a reminder on that. Would you receive the sending this morning? And now... May God, our Father, who loved us and created us, may Jesus, who saved us and redeemed us, and may the Holy Spirit, who fills us and unites us with Christ, receive all glory and honor and praise forever. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>